Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes. Uh, so it's Dr. Eric Shumake with you. <clears throat> I think I've met a lot of you from uh, the workshops we did there last year. So excited to do brain octane for you today. Uh, give you some good tips on how to improve your brain function. <clears throat> if you're dealing with sleep problems, mood problems, memory issues, brain fog, uh, we have your solutions today. So we'll get started in just a couple of minutes here. Looks like we have about 10 of us on right now. We'll also be, uh, I'll be looking at the chat uh, throughout the webinar too to, to answer any questions. So if you have questions, you can go ahead and drop those in the chat bar and uh, I'll be monitoring those. I always find this is a good time of year to do uh, to talk about sleep after daylight savings. It seems to screw up everybody's sleep schedule. So we'll talk about how you can uh, have better sleep hygiene and some tricks that you can do to sleep through the night a lot better, which is you'll find out has a lot to do with your memory and brain function uh, with sleep. So another minute or so and we will get going. Looks like we're just having a couple more people join. All right, it is 8.30, so let's get going. So again, uh, for those of you I haven't met, my name is Dr. Eric Shoemake. I am uh, have a chiropractic office and functional medicine clinic here in town in Denver. So <clears throat> I know we, uh, we did a challenge there last year and we, we, we did a lot of uh, nutrition work. So we'll, we'll revisit some of that. So if you're at any of those workshops, probably get a few things just reminded to you today. Uh, but we're also gonna be talking about your brain and how to take care of your brain. So. Uh, we're going to discuss how to improve your memory. <clears throat> we're going to discuss how to sleep better because you'll see that sleep is the key to a lot of things when it comes to memory and mood. So we'll discuss mood as well. And then we're going to discuss how to avoid the chemicals uh, that are causing a lot of issues when it comes to brain issues like dementia, Alzheimer's, things that have been linked to those and how you can make some simple changes to avoid those things as well to really improve the way your brain functions. So first thing I want to go through is what I call the uh, it, it, the healthcare tsunami. So this is just talking about what's happening right now in our country. And so we have a lot of baby boomers that are retiring or retired right now. So at their peak, we're going to have 78 million baby boomers will retired at the same time. 18% of them will have Alzheimer's disease. That is a massive number. Uh, the average cost of caring for these patients is $203 a day per person. And if you extrapolate that out to 78 million baby boomers and 20% of the high Alzheimer's disease, that's $3 billion a day or $1 trillion a year, which is a massive, massive burden on society, not to mention um, a horrific thing to go through if you're a relative or the person dealing with dementia or Alzheimer's. And the, it's really on the rise. So if you look here, 2005, there were 25 million people dealing with Alzheimer's. By 2050, we're talking about 106 million people. So that's worldwide. So what we want to do is uh, discuss how we can take steps to take care of our brain. Because I, I just heard somebody uh, there on TV talking about Alzheimer's and they said, well, the horrible thing is you can't do anything to prevent it. And there's no warning signs. Um, but there are ways to prevent it. I'm going to go through ways that you can take care of your brain because Alzheimer's isn't just something that just, oh, it's genetic. There's nothing I can do about it. There's ways you could take care of your brain to, uh, to reduce your risk of dealing with any type of cognitive decline over your life. So one thing that a lot of people don't talk about, so we're going to talk about things like sleep, like I said, what, what a lot of people are not talking about, which we should be, is the chemicals that we are now putting in our brain. So what's changing between 2005 and 2050? Like, why are so many more people going to have Alzheimer's disease? We don't have four times the population in the world that we had in 2005. So something is causing that to go up. Um, and I think it's multifactorial. But one of the things is the chemicals that we're actually putting in our body, largely through our food. So I'm going to discuss two things today. One is glyphosate. 
and the other one is is uh, aspartame. So both aspartame and glyphosate have been linked to neurodegenerative illness. Okay. Now the problem is, is that both of those are very heavily added to a lot of foods in our in our society and our food supply. So um, I'm going to give you a, this is a pretty stark example of what I'm discussing here. So these are two different charts: age adjust, adjusted deaths from senile dementia, and then this is. Uh, correlation between uh, the autism diagnosis in kids and gly glyphosate applications to our food. So two diseases specifically have really risen since the early to, to late, actually late early 90s to, to mid 90s. And one of those is senile dementia. The other one is, is autism. You've probably heard people talk about the rise in autism. Um, autism has gone up. When I got out of school, it was one in you know five to 10,000 people. Now it's one in 32 boys are on the autism spectrum. So you got to think, well, what happened, right? So if you look over here, just dementia, um, if we just we were just going up in terms of population, what the expected rate of dementia rise would be this, this line right here. But you see what happened in the mid 90s, it started exploding. So a lot more people dying of, of senile dementia. And what this red line shows is this, this is the glyphosate application rise. So we started putting a lot more glyphosate on our food in the, in the mid 90s. And glyphosate is Roundup. I'll, I'll discuss more about what that is in a second. It's a weed killer. But you can see up, 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 up. And it almost matches the rise in dementia. If you go over here with, with autism, same thing. Up, 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 up. Now, is that the only cause of autism? No, but I, again, I think this is a multifactorial thing we have to look at. And glyphosate has been linked to neurodegenerative illnesses. It's also been linked to cancer, by the way. So uh, glyphosate is the, the weed killer called Roundup. Okay. And Roundup, you, you probably have seen that in the store, like in Home Depot or Lowe's and you spray it on your weeds. Well, they also spray that on crops, specifically corn, soy, and wheat. Okay. Now corn is in so many things. Corn derivatives are in so many foods. Um, wheat is in so many foods. Soy is in so many foods, but things like soy protein isolate. Well, well, those are the most heavily sprayed crops. And there's so when Monsanto actually sold uh, the the company, uh, and then the new owners that, that bought the company it was actually a pharmaceutical company bought the company, and they set aside ten billion dollars to settle lawsuits for glyphosate causing neurodegenerative illnesses and cancer. They've already paid out several billion dollars, uh, where the judges said yes, this caused your cancer, this caused your neurodevelopmental uh, or neuro neurodevelopmental decline. So what we're looking at here is. This is called glyphosate residual. So these are the foods that are that have the most levels of glyphosate. So Oreos, um, why? Again, wheat. We're talking there, right? Um, potato chips, Doritos, Fritos, goldfish. We're feeding this to the kids. Um, all of these things had a high level of glyphosate. They're actually looking at glyphosate residual. So some of the worst ones here. Um, these are parts per billion. So one of the worst ones here is you know Stacy's baked pita chips. People think, oh, pita chips are good for me. Um, oatmeal cream pies from Little Debbie, again, very high. Um, oatmeal cream pies from Lucy, really high because oats are another heavily sprayed, uh, sprayed crop. And then you get over here, and what are the things that had the most levels of glyphosate? So Cheerios, Lucky Charms, um, Nature Valley, like granola bars, which you see. So if you see these Kellogg's cereals, so if you see these, what you're actually getting is glyphosate residual because it's sprayed on the crops. So and I'm going to show you how you can avoid this in just a minute. So the best ones would, would be like anything. This is Whole Foods brand. Um, Kashi was low in glyphosate residual. Cascadian Farms, low in glyphosate residual. Nature's Path, low in glyphosate residual. Simple Truth Organic, low. Now, why is that? Because these are organic. OK, so if you look for something that says organic or non-GMO. OK, so this if you non-GMO verified right here, this label that's on food. Glyphosate free residual is even better label. Now this isn't as widespread because this is fairly new, but if you look at for glyphosate residual free product, which is what this avocado oil says, this is the avocado oil that we use all the time. Um, glyphosate residual free product, there's no glyphosate in this. If it says non-GMO, you're generally gonna have no glyphosate in it. If it says organic, generally gonna have lower or no glyphosate. So when you can buy organic, I recommend doing that, especially for things like boxed foods, because if you look at all of these things that were high, these are all like boxed foods. So if you're looking at organic, non-GMO, that's how you can actually avoid glyphosate. Okay, so that's that's one thing that you can start doing right away. Another thing we can start doing is avoiding artificial sweeteners. Now I did talk about this when I was there last year, specifically 
um, artificial sweeteners like um, aspartame. Okay, so aspartame is is equal. So if you you know if you go in the any type of restaurant and you look at the sugar that's on the table there, uh, you're gonna see. Pull this up here. Sorry, you're going to see equal. You're going to see, so you're going to see a pink packet. You're going to see a blue packet. You're going to see a yellow packet. The pink packet is saccharin. That's an artificial sweetener. The uh, um, blue packet is aspartame. That's an artificial sweetener. And then the yellow packet is sucralose, which is an artificial sweetener. I don't say you shouldn't eat. I, I, very rarely do I say never eat something. That's one I would say never eat. Because where you find those things is in sugar-free or diet products. Okay, so we'll show you where those come from in just a minute. But this is just an article from... Uh, the Journal of Nutrition, sugar and artificially sugar artificially sweetened beverages and the risk of stroke and dementia. What they were saying is that though the, the, the uh, products that were sweetened with sugar did not increase the risk of stroke and, and dementia, but the ones sweetened with artificial sweeteners did. They did a study in, the, in Framingham that is called the Framingham Heart Study, and they found that people that were uh, consuming diet beverages on a daily basis were three times more likely to have stroke and dementia um, than ones that weren't. Now, why is that? Well, the reason for that is because of what it does to your brain. So where are you gonna find aspartame specifically? So that's gonna be in like Diet Coke, um, Slim Fast. The, so anything that they want to have that is sweet to reduce calories, they're usually gonna put aspartame in. So um, candy, gum, so this is like, you know, dentine ice. Um, it's in yogurt, it can be in juices. So if you wanna write something down, write that word down right there, aspartame, and you want to avoid aspartame at all costs. So I would much rather, instead of you do a Diet Coke, I'd rather you do just a regular Coke. Uh, there's also been a lot of research on the, the beverages that cause the most weight gain. So most people drink Diet Coke because they're like, oh, I don't want the sugar, I want to lose weight. But they found that the, the one uh, consumption of the one beverage that caused was correlated with the most weight gain was Diet Coke. Because aspartame and Diet Coke can also affect your appetite center. So it can make you more hungry and you consume more calories. Um, so if you're going to drink a Coke, I'd rather you just do, drink the regular Coke. Now what aspartame does, Number one is when, when it, it comes into the body, it actually gets turned and broken down into formaldehyde and then gets broken down into wood alcohol. All right. So wood alcohol is, is you see, if you ever see that show Moonshiners and you see people go blind from drinking moonshine, it's because that's wood alcohol that they're, that they're drinking. Well, that same thing happens chemically in your body when you do aspartame. And that has been shown directly to damage DNA and affect the signaling to your brain. So not good news. You don't want anything that's damaging DNA in your brain. Um, and that's what this aspartame does. It's called an excitatory neurotoxin. So if there's one thing that you can absolutely avoid, it's aspartame. So it's in some surprising things. So sometimes you'll see it in, you see it in almost every gum. So if you're chewing gum, uh, like Orbitz or any of those gums, look on the back. If you have that in your, you know, at your desk or wherever you are, look at it and you'll see it says aspartame. Okay, and it might even say xylitol, which we talked about last time was a good sweetener, but they'll put xylitol and aspartame in. So you got to watch out for that. It's in anything that says sugar-free and it's in anything that says diet, typically. That's where you're going to find it, okay? Now, not always. So I, I drink uh, vitamin water. So vitamin water zero has no sugar, no calories. But if you look on the back and you read the food label, and we did, we did a lot of food label reading last time I was there. If you look on the back and look at the food label, it says it is uh, sweetened with erythritol and erythritol is a natural uh, sugar alcohol. It's not an artificial sweetener. So that one's okay. But if you drink zero sugar or Coke zero, you'll look and you'll see aspartame. So you just got to read the food label and they got to print it. It's right there on there. So if you can avoid that, <clears throat> that's where we're going to be again in really good shape. Okay. So again, any questions that you guys have as we get through this, go ahead and uh, pop them in the, in the chat and I'll, uh, I'll cover those for you. Okay. So the next one here. So memory, uh, how do you get your memory to improve? If you're dealing with brain fog, so as, you, as we tend to get older, you'll notice like, okay, I can't remember the, maybe the words I was going to say like I used to, or I can't remember numbers like I used to. Um, and a lot of it's because we don't use our brains like we used to. So you used to have to remember phone numbers. I like, I, like, I don't even know my children's phone numbers. <laughs> it's just in my phone. I have no idea what their phone numbers are. Um, but we used to have to remember numbers. I, I delivered pizza <clears throat> when I was in college and I used to have to look at the map. I, I don't know how we found anybody's homes, but I would like, I grab my pizza box. I would look at the map. I would go, okay, I got to turn right, turn left, turn right, turn left. And then second, third, fourth, right. Okay. And I, that's how I would find it, which seems super archaic now because we just have Google maps on our phone. 
Um, but we were actually using our brains a lot more. Well, we, we don't have to use our memories very much. And there's a, there's a use it or lose it component when it comes to memory. So there's five things that you can do to increase your memory that are free or close to free uh, that have been shown to increase your brain density. So one thing that they found in dementia and Alzheimer's upon autopsy when they do an autopsy is that people with dementia or Alzheimer's have what's called a light brain. Um, so it doesn't, it's not as dense as a healthy brain. And the reason for that is it doesn't have as many neural connections, okay? So you wanna have lots of neural connections in your brain. You wanna, so your brain can actually stimulate new dendrites and new connections, it's called neuroplasticity. So the more you're using your memory, the more you're doing these things right here, it actually increases neuronal connection in your brain to increase memory, which is what we all want, right? So one way to do that is through meditation or mindfulness. So there's been all kinds of studies around meditation and mindfulness showing that it actually increases the density of your brain, specifically in something called the substantia Niagara, um, which is one of the main relay centers for your brain. So what does meditation look like for people? And this is, I think meditation a lot of times is misunderstood because we think you have to sit there and just zen out and not think about one thought uh, for 20 minutes but you don't, what you're doing is training your brain. So think of it like your brain and your, and your concentration or focus like a, like a muscle. So when I sit down and I try to meditate, I don't know about you, but I don't just think no thoughts. I might think, okay, I'm gonna sit down for even five minutes and I'm just gonna focus on my breath. So I'm gonna focus on breathing in, I'm gonna focus on breathing out and that's the only thing I'm gonna focus on. The problem with that is what am I gonna think about 30 seconds into it? I'm going to think about what's for breakfast. I'm going to think about uh, this email that I need to send. I'm going to think about where I'm going on vacation. I'm, I'm going to think about, um, you know, I got I to gotta finish up something for work. There's a ton of things that I'm going to think about other than my breath, right? But the muscle in this and the way you're actually to build those connections is if you can just recognize your focus going somewhere else and go, oh, I'm not thinking about my breath anymore and just bring it back to your breath. That's the memory. That's the repetition that you want. That's like doing bench press or curls for your arms. That's a one repetition. So when I go into the gym, I don't just, you know, and I want to, you know, improve my, my biceps. I don't just stand there with the bar. I actually do repetitions. Well, that's what you're doing in meditation when you're actually bringing your focus back. So in, in 15 or 10 minutes, which is what it takes, they say 10 or 15 minutes a day. Um, it doesn't even, you, you're never going to have just, most people are not going to get to the point where they're just thinking, oh, breath, breath, breath. They're going to have, they're going to have their, their mind run to another area. And the repetition is just bringing it back to normal or bringing it back to your breath, just coming back to center. And that's been shown for people that do that. They've done studies for even up to 90 days. If you do that, I think it was four to five times a week for 90 days and it's 10 to 15 minutes a day, it increases your brain density. And that's what we wanna do. We wanna have heavy brains, but this is one way that you wanna be dense, okay? Now, another one, and this one has gotten a bad rap in the past, but game playing. Now, can this be overdone? Of course, if you're spending uh, 16 hours a day, a kid spending 16 hours a day on a game or on a computer playing a computer game, there's issues with posture and other things. But like if you're just playing games, so there's games that you can play on your phone. One of those games is like Lumosity. So if you've ever heard of that one, uh, that's an app you can put on your phone on a website, Lumosity, L-U-M-I-S, L-U-M-O-S-I-T-Y, Lumosity. And you can actually play like memory games where if you remember those old games where it would flip a it'll flip like a person's face and then you flip, flip another person's face and you have to remember where they were and it'll turn around if you don't get them right. So you're like, it actually has you exercise your memory. Um, Sudoku, crossword puzzles, all of those things are really, really good for stimulating neural connection in the brain. Uh, another really good one uh, is, is eating foods rich in omega-3 fats. I'm going to discover that, or talk about that, discuss that in a little bit here. So omega-3 fats are very important for your brain because your brain is primarily fat. It's made up primarily of fat. So you have what's called a phospholipid bilayer in your brain. That's the majority of your brain. And if you feed that properly with things like fish, fish oil, flaxseed oil, again, we'll discuss those in a little bit. Those have also been shown to increase your brain density. Uh, another one, exercise. So I think we've known this for a long time. Um, exercise, and what we're talking about here is 30 minutes of exercise, five days a week, okay? So 150 minutes of exercise a week, 30 minutes of exercise, five days a week. And that's really any exercise. That would be uh, the elliptical machine, the treadmill, gym, uh, like lifting weights, anything, uh, riding a bike, any of those things, any exercise increases your brain density because you're actually moving joints. 
So when you're, when you're, when your spine and your, and your brain and uh, are connected and then all the joints are moving the way they're supposed to, you're actually getting neural stimulation into the brain that creates more neural connection. So exercise increases brain density, which is huge. And then the last one down here is learning how to play an instrument. So any new skill. So another good one is learning a language. So learning a second, trying to learn a second language. Uh, my mom just moved to Portugal and she's trying to learn Portuguese. So she's getting a lot of neural connections. Um, so playing an instrument. So I've been playing guitar my whole life. It doesn't really do much for me now neuroplasticity wise because I know how to play guitar. But if I try to play banjo, which I just started trying to do recently, all kinds of new neural connections because that thing, I don't know how to make that thing sound good. Um, so, and you don't have to be Mozart, just playing, you know, a little bit of learning how to play piano. You can do so much of this online now where you can get a keyboard and you can look online on YouTube and learn how to play your favorite song, uh, that you, that you hear on the radio. So you, you, you can do that really easily. And that increases your, your brain density as well. They did a, a study, this is on London cab drivers versus London bus drivers. And they looked at the, the, the neural, um, density in the brain. And they found that cab drivers had a much higher brain density than the bus drivers after doing this for 10 or 15 years. Now, why is that? Because bus drivers weren't using their brain. They were just going from point to point to point to point to point. They didn't have to really think about and create new connections. What are cab drivers doing? They're looking at, oh, how am I going to get there? Uh, and this is pre-GPS. How am I going to get there? What's the quickest way to get there? If this uh, road is slow, I'm going to go to this road. So they're making all kinds of choices and decisions. So that's a similar thing that happens when you're learning any new skill. So you want to be challenging your brain. So all five of those things are ways to improve your brain function. So we're talking 10 to 15 minutes a day of meditation, four or five days a week, uh, playing like a Lumosity game, even a video game, a game on your phone um, that re requires a little bit of strategy is great. Increasing omega-3s, exercise, and then just learning. So learning how to new, do new things and new skills. And those are all free or virtually free. Um, so what I want to do is take care of my brain long term. I, I, I've seen dementia in my family. My, my grandmother had uh, Alzheimer's disease. She died when she was 67. And I, I don't want any of that. And my grandmother, by the way, you know, didn't do any of this stuff. So if you do some of these things, can you still have Alzheimer's? Yes, some people, but it lowers your risk because, again, when they do the autopsies on people with dementia and Alzheimer's versus people that didn't have it, the brain density was what the difference was. And we always want to have a, a, a dense brain there. All right. So somebody asked, uh, are there ways to reverse the effects of aspartame? Um, there are things that are neuroprotective for your brain. Uh, so as far as, as far as reversing, no. Once that chemical reaction happens and it turns to formaldehyde, that's causing neurodegeneration. Um, but there are ways to protect your brain uh, long term. So one of those would be omega oils. Okay, so foods rich in omega threes. That's one way to do it, and we'll discuss dosage in a few minutes. And there's uh, some other things that you can do with supplements that can help your brain. I'll discuss in just a few minutes as well. One of them is called N-acetylcysteine. So good question there. All right. So now I want to spend some time on sleep. Okay. So we don't really think about sleep other than being, oh, I'm tired or I, I have, you know, I have energy or I don't. We don't really think about sleep doing much more than just making us, you know, more alert for the next day. But sleep, I'm going to go through the phases of sleep and what good sleep and good sleep hygiene actually does for you. But we also want to discuss the consequences of poor sleep. So these were two people, um, just two famous people recently, pretty recently that have died from lack of sleep. And that's, that's what caused, so Heath Ledger, if you remember, he was in, you know, The Joker, he's been in a ton of different movies. Um, Heath Ledger died from an overdose from a cocktail of drugs that he was taking because he couldn't sleep. So he was a famous insomniac, like he just, he'd, he'd go do a movie shoot and he'd just sleep two hours a night, he just wouldn't sleep. So he started taking sleep medications. He started turning to harder drugs, like prescription drugs, like um, oxycodone, Vicodin, because those things can help people sleep, Percocet. Uh, he was drinking alcohol, and then he did all of those at the same time, and he died from an overdose of those things. And it wasn't even an overdose, it was just a mixture of those things, which can be very dangerous when you're taking those all together. Prince was another one. Prince, um, they said when in the five days, he hadn't slept in the five days before he died, before he passed away, he hadn't slept one minute for five days. And he started taking, again, he turned to opioids. So he was taking opioid medications. That was kind of the only thing that would knock him out. And um, he actually died from an overdose. So the consequences of poor sleep can be that dire. But the other consequences of poor sleep are going to be lack of focus, lack of memory, and poor brain health overall. Okay, so what I wanted to get into here for a couple of minutes is what are the stages of sleep? And then what are some levers that you can use to get better sleep? 
So first of all, the amount of sleep that, that we should be getting as, as an adult is about eight hours, okay, about eight hours. So you want to have four to five stages of sleep, an complete cycle of sleep, four to five cycles of sleep uh, throughout your, your night. And that usually takes seven to eight hours. You can't get that many cycles in five hours because each of these um, cycles, when you go through an entire cycle, takes about 90 minutes. So if you do 90 minutes times five, you know, we're talking four and a half hour, I mean, seven and a half hours there. So seven, eight hours of sleep is what you want ideally. Now, what happens when you sleep? So first of all, before we get to these things that you can do to sleep better, I want to explain what happens when you're sleeping. So first thing, this is called non-REM stage one. Okay, we'll get into what REM sleep is, rapid eye movement sleep is in a minute. So non-REM sleep one takes about five to 10 minutes. That's where you're falling asleep. Okay, so that's where you're kind of going from wake to sleep, takes about five or 10 minutes. And then you get into this non-REM stage two. So stage two over here um, takes about 20 minutes and that's where you're really getting into deeper sleep. So you're going down, 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 down to deeper levels of sleep when you're in stage two. So, and a lot of things happen there. Your body temperature drops, your heart rate slows down. So uh, that's preparing you for sleep. But the interesting ones are the ones I wanna talk about are stage three, and then REM. So this would be stage three and stage four. So stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. So this, a couple of things happen in deep, this is called deep sleep delta waves of so your body's producing delta waves. So deep sleep, um, stage three sleep is very, very important for repairing your brain and, and undoing damage that happened to your body during the day. So a couple of things happen here that are really important. Number one is especially the first deep sleep uh, site, or, uh, first deep sleep stage that you get. So in the first time you go through this 90 minute cycle, the first time you go through stage three, because you'll go through this cycle again, every 90 minutes. And so you'll go through that several times when you're sleeping at night. The first time you get to, to stage three over here is one thing that happens is you're going to increase your, your growth hormone. So human growth hormone levels go up dramatically. You get a bolus of human growth hormone and human growth hormone is what basically repairs all the damage that you did throughout the day to every organ in your body. So if you were hard on your liver that day, then growth hormone can undo that damage. So we talked about, can you undo the damage from aspartame? Yes, you can, you can undo a lot of damage from any chemical or any, any toxin that you put in your body. You can undo some of that damage, especially in your liver by, from human growth hormone. So it's actually going to repair your body. So every single second in your body, 50,000 cells die and get replaced. And your body's doing a lot of that through human growth hormone, okay? So you get a big dose of human growth hormone. Human growth hormone is also anti-aging. That's you know, the higher level of human growth hormone you have. It's called the fountain of youth hormone. You're going to get a lot of that, especially in your, your, your first stage three experience when you go to sleep. This is why it's so important to have a consistent sleep schedule, because if you, if you sleep deprive yourself, so if you fight sleep and you miss that first, so say you normally go to bed at 10 o'clock, your body's rhythm is used to going to bed at 10. If you stay up till midnight or 1230 and you still get up at the same time part of the reason you feel so bad is because you missed out on this deep sleep stage three you missed out on that first one you're not going to get that same growth hormone level at, when you in your first first uh, sleep cycle at midnight that you would have at 10 so if you miss that sleep cycle that you normally get from 10 o'clock to midnight you've missed it you're not going to make it up later because your body's in that circadian rhythm so you want to make sure that you're going to bed at the same time and you're getting into this deep sleep right here so you get growth hormone number one the second thing that you're going to get is an actual cleansing of your brain. So because of these, the delta waves, you actually get a pulsing of your brain that flushes out what's called beta amyloid proteins. Okay. And beta amyloid proteins are what build up in your brain over just normal activity, normal metabolic activity over the day. And those things have been linked to Alzheimer's disease. That's what causes the plaques that cause Alzheimer's. Well, one of the ways that your brain is, is getting rid of those plaques is the normal pulsing that happens in stage three or deep rest. So this is when your body's healing, if you think about it, okay? And then when, when you get out of phase or stage three, you're gonna move over into REM sleep. REM sleep is one of the ones everybody talks about. This is where your body is, this is where you dream, number one. Rapid eye movement is happening. That's when you're dreaming. Um, and then one interesting thing that happens there is you also get a paralysis or an atonia. So your body literally can't move. So if you've ever had a dream where somebody was coming after you and you can't get away, like I, I couldn't run, it's because your brain knows your brain is that your body is actually atonic or not able to move during that time. So that's getting in, or getting introduced into your dream, which is really interesting. But in your dream, in that dream state, you're getting, and these are typically shorter periods of time. So um, 15 to 20 minutes for, for REM sleep, most of the cycles. 
some of them get a little bit longer later in the night. So you might think that you've been, you're having a dream that lasted six hours, but you're not. That's, that's a very short amount of time where you're typically having those dreams. So what's important scientifically and what's happening during that time, this is where your body is making dopamine. Okay. Dopamine is what makes you happy and focused. We're going to discuss dopamine in a minute. So if you're having problems with focus or any type of like depression or anything like that, that's a lot of that's going to be low levels of dopamine. So this is where your body makes dopamine. So you want to make sure you're getting REM sleep. And then your body is also consolidating memory here. So it's taking all the things that you've learned throughout the day and it's consolidating memory, which is again, very important for having a dense brain. So you want to make sure that what's the moral of the story that you're getting to sleep and you're staying asleep. Because if I wake up at, you know, four o'clock in the morning and I don't go back to sleep until six o'clock, I'm still missing out on a whole um, sleep cycle here. Now, if you wake up at three o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning and you go back to sleep in five minutes, you're going to be right on track where you need to be. It's pretty normal to wake up in the middle of the night. It's not normal to wake up and not be able to go back to sleep. Okay. So what I want to discuss now is how to have deep restful sleep. So what are some sleep levers that you can pull? Well, one of those, and this is just cooperating with your body's neurobiology. One of them is light. Okay. We'll discuss that in a second. So there's ways that you can use light to your advantage. Um, temperature is another one. So there's a ways, ways that you can use temperature to your advantage and not just the temperature that you sleep at in your room, but then also food and supplements. So like, what does alcohol do for your sleep? What does caffeine do for your sleep? Um, we'll discuss those things in just a minute. So first of all, just right off the bat, there has never been a study that shows that alcohol improves your sleep. It always disrupts your sleep. Uh, 100% of the time. So especially as it gets closer to bedtime. So if you're, if you're used to like, oh, I just have a glass of wine to make me relax. So I go to sleep. It might make you relax. So you fall asleep, but it causes you to wake up later or have less restful sleep in this stage three and REM sleep. So alcohol is not your friend if it comes to sleep. Caffeine is not your friend when it comes to sleep, if it's done after about three o'clock in the afternoon. So anything after about three o'clock in the afternoon, caffeine wise is going to interfere with your sleep. Now, you can use caffeine to your advantage in the morning, which we'll discuss. You can do some things in the morning that will increase uh, your dopamine levels that will help you sleep later on. Okay, so let's get into what that looks like. So elements of great sleep. Number one, light and dark. So I'm not just talking about it being dark in your room when you sleep. I'm talking about direct sun exposure in the morning. So if you've heard of Andrew Huberman, he's, he has a great podcast called The Huberman Lab. You can take a lot deeper dive into sleep if you want to check his podcast out. But he talks about what you can do throughout the day to help you sleep at night. So the way that our bodies were designed is if you think back to, you know, thousands of years ago, we were sleeping in a dark cave and then we would get up when the sun came up and we would go out and do our things. Well, one thing that happens when you go out into the sunlight early in the day is the type of light that's coming in from sunlight gets goes to a certain part of your eye, goes to a certain part of your brain, and that stimulates wakefulness. So it wakes you up a lot quicker than if you were just staying in a dark room. So you want to go out and you want to get direct sun exposure in the, in the first 30 minutes of waking. It only takes about five minutes of direct sun exposure in your eyes, not with sunglasses, not through a window that decreases it pretty dramatically. So what I do is I try to get up and we'll talk about what to do if you get up in the dark in a minute. But if you can get up in the first 30 minutes to an hour of waking and go view sunlight. So I'll go out in my backyard, I'll let the dog out, and the sun's usually coming up. I don't stare at the sun. I'm just looking around, looking at the sky, and I'm getting sunlight into my eyes. So what that does is it stimulates a cortisol release, okay? Now, cortisol, stick with me on the science here. Cortisol is the hormone uh, that helps your body have energy, okay? So people think of cortisol being bad because cortisol means stress. Elevated cortisol for long periods of time is not good. That's not what I'm talking about here. You have a normal cortisol arc throughout the day, okay? And so when you wake up in the morning, you want your cortisol level to go up. And then you, when you go throughout the day, you want your cortisol level to slowly go down. Okay. So you want it to be high when you get up in the morning, low, when you go to sleep, think of it as like packets of energy. You want a lot of packets of energy in the morning, less when you go to sleep at night. So when you get up and you view sunlight, one of the things you're going to, you're going to be seeing or happen in your body is that cortisol level goes up. Okay. And when the cortisol level goes up that automatically, and this is important, when your cortisol level goes up in the morning, and there's a few ways that you can do that. Viewing light is one way that will raise that cortisol level as quickly as you can. When the cortisol levels go up, it's also going to trigger your melatonin levels to kick in about 16 to 18 hours later. Okay. So it's going to say, okay, your brain, your body gets up. You look at the sun. You're like, okay, cool. It's wake time now. I'm going to want to be asleep 16 to 18 hours later. So it sets this clock in motion that stimulates melatonin, which helps you sleep later. So believe it or not, what you do in the first 30 minutes of waking up has a lot to do with how well you're going to sleep uh, later on that night. 
So viewing sunlight in the first 30 minutes a day is huge. If you wake up in the dark and you can't view sunlight, so, so you wake up at 5.30 and it's the middle of the winter, you're not gonna be able to see sunlight right away. So artificial bright light can also do the same thing. So going in the bathroom, you know, turning on all the lights, not just you know, dimming the lights, all the lights to kick that cortisol level up, that's what we want. Um, you can also use, uh, they've, they've done studies on um, cortisol release from light on those, uh, what are those ring lights that people use for selfies? So I know some people where they, you know, they'll live, I, I, a patient actually lived in, um, in, uh, in Alaska and they, the sunlight during certain parts of the year was, was non-existent. So they were talking, they got one of those uh, ring lights that people use for selfies and they would just go turn that thing on and, and you know, brush their teeth while the light was hitting them that can do the same things. But if you can get outside, especially like now in the summer, if you can get outside in the first 30 minutes, that's huge. And then the other thing that you can do for light is you don't want light in your room at night. So you want it as dark as you can get it at night um, and pitch black or as close to pitch black as you can. And you don't want to expose your body to blue light. Okay, now blue light is what comes out of your phone. Okay, so this is the type of light that's getting emitted when you're reading your phone at night or reading your tablet at night is blue light. So what you can do if you're using your tablet at night is you can go into your phone and you can go to settings and you can get the blue light filter, okay? So you can click on blue light filter and it will change the wavelength of light that's coming out of there. Now, the reason blue light is a problem is blue light decreases your melatonin levels. So if you're reading a tablet or on your phone before you go to bed a couple hours or to an hour before you go to bed at night, that reduces your melatonin levels and melatonin is what actually helps you fall asleep, okay? So get up and look at light in the morning and then try to keep it as dark as you can in the evening when you go actually go into sleep. And that even means before you're going to sleep. So if you're sitting around watching TV or hanging out, talking to your family, uh, you want to dim the lights. And, and we really do that as much as we can. When it gets darker at night or it gets later at night, we want to dim the lights. You don't want light, bright light, because that's again, going to affect your melatonin levels. Another thing is exercise. So we talked about that for density of your brain, but another great way to improve your sleep is exercise. So this is a study um, that they did at the Cooper Institute in Dallas. And they said getting 150 minutes of exercise uh, a week increased their sleep uh, improvement by 65%. So people in, improve their sleep quality by 65% by exercising. Now that's exercise anytime during the day. The best way to, best time to do exercise, if you ask me, is earlier in the day. It doesn't have to be right when you wake up. But the reason I say earlier in the day is there, that's another thing that's going to increase your cortisol levels right away. Right, so you want that cortisol level to spike as quickly as you can to set yourself up to sleep later. One way, great way to do that is um, is early in the day exercise. Okay, now one other one, and this has been popular lately, which is cold exposure. Okay, this is where, this is where I lose people sometimes, but I'll show you how to actually do a cold shower here. So cold exposure, um, we talked about temperature being one of your sleep triggers. If you can raise your body's body temperature early. Um, that's going to stimulate your cortisol levels, just like seeing light will, right? So especially if you're getting up in the, in the morning and you can't see light, one good way to stimulate that, that spike in cortisol that's going to wake you up and put you to sleep later is going to be a cold shower. So it raises body temperature. It's also, but cold exposure has also been shown to improve your immune system and it raises your baseline dopamine levels. Now, this is really big. So not only does it, it so you think about how does, a, how does a cold shower increase my body temperature? Well, it's going to increase your body temperature because your body rebounds. So if you do cold exposure, they actually measure your body temperature five minutes later, your body temperature goes up after that. So it does that. But the second thing that it does is it increases your baseline dopamine level. So this is a free way to get dopamine. Another way to get dopamine, your dopamine levels go up uh, when you do, uh, when you eat, eat like um, uh, chocolate. Um, there's a lot of ways to raise your, your dopamine levels, but the problem is those things, they'll do like a spike and then it'll lower. So if you eat chocolate, it goes up and goes down. If you like sex is one, if you have sex, it goes up, goes down. If you, um, if you look at your phone and you see you've got an alert, it goes up and it goes down. So dopamine is like a reward chemical. So we don't want dopamine always going up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down artificially because we're eating chocolate all day long. What we want it to do is go up and stay up because what goes up must come down. So if it goes up artificially and it gets down, you're going to get a lot of dips in dopamine. Um, so we want those baseline levels of dopamine to go up. And one way that does that raises your dopamine levels throughout the day is cold exposure. So what I do in a cold shower, it only takes 30 seconds to a minute of exposure to cold to get these benefits and effects that I'm talking about. So here's the way I do it. You don't just turn on the shower and cold and jump in that you can do that. That's tough to do. Um, but what you do, especially at the beginning as you're learning to do this, and that's just really kind of all I do now I've done kind of 
hardcore 30 days of cold exposure where I would go out and like lay in the, just put shorts on and go lay in the snow. Um, I would do, you know, really cold water exposure, like cold baths. And I've done all of that, but to get the, the benefit, it's really 30 seconds to a minute. So I'm like, if I can get that from just doing a simple cold shower, I'll do that. So the way you do that is you go in, you take a normal shower, turn it on warm, take your normal shower. Um, and then at that point I turn it to cold. So as cold as my shower will go. And then I spend 30 seconds to a minute. I literally look at the clock and I spend 30 seconds to a minute and it's water that will, it's like, it'll kind of take your breath away. It's cold. But at the end of that minute, turn the water back up to warm. You get a big, you know, it feels really good when you get the warm water back on you. So warm your body up and then get out and go about your day. Your levels of dopamine went up. Your cortisol levels will go up right afterwards and your, uh, your immune system will be improved. So that's the way you do a cold shower. A couple of things that happen here, number one. Uh, if you want to do a lot more research on cold therapy, uh, Wim Hof is, is the kind of the pioneer of this. He's, he's, a, he's a Dutch guy. Um, W-I-M-H-O-F is his name. And his whole thing is cold exposure. And he does, he's done world record cold exposure uh, and, you know, just crazy things that, you know, a lot of people uh, would have a hard time doing. But what he talks about in there is like, our bodies were not meant to be this comfortable. Like we are very comfortable physically on a day-to-day -day basis. Like we never really have to uh, deal with physical challenges very much. Like most people don't get really out of breath in a day. Most people don't get really cold in a day. Most people don't get super hungry in a day. But that's really, if you look at our neurobiology, that's kind of the way we were, we came up, you know, the way in the last couple thousand years, few thousand years here, you know, if you look back in the hunter gatherers, they were cold a lot. Um, they were hungry a lot. They were, they were physically taxed a lot. And our, you know, now we don't have to deal with that very much. So our baseline levels of dopamine go down a lot. So one thing this does when I take a cold shower is I think, you know what? Um, I can do hard things. And that's a great thing I tell my patients all the time is that you can do hard things. Oh, it's hard to eat this instead of that. You know what? It is, but it's rewarding and you can do hard things. It's hard to go to the gym five days a week. You know what? It is, but you can do hard things. So just remembering I can do hard things. I can, I can stick to the meal plan that I want to. I can, I can be disciplined with my exercise. I can do hard things because you can. And I get kind of a reward from that because I'm like, oh, I wanted to do that hard thing. I did that hard thing. Good things are happening. And when you do hard things, guess what happens to your dopamine levels? They go up. So when you say, I'm going to go to the gym on Monday and you actually don't go to the gym on Monday, your dopamine levels go down. If you go figure, I'm going to go to the gym and you actually do it, your dopamine levels actually go up. Okay. So let me get to the dopamine here. Okay. So why is dopamine important? We're going to, I told you we're going to talk about mood. Uh, so a few more minutes and then we'll wrap it up for some questions. So these are symptoms of low dopamine in your body, depression, anxiety, mood swings. How much more depression, anxiety, and mood swings are we seeing just in the last three years? People's mental health, especially after COVID has really gone down the tubes. So having so many more people dealing with depression and anxiety than we ever have. Low sex drive, lack of motivation, loss of interest in activities, difficulty concentrating or focusing because dopamine is your concentration um, neurobiology uh, uh, signal, right? So that, that when you have higher levels of dopamine, you are more focused and you're more concentrated. Sleep disturbances or insomnia because dopamine has a lot to do with how you sleep, can even cause tremors, restless leg, and even digestive issues, okay? So low levels of dopamine, if you have any of those, we really wanna work on getting your dopamine levels higher. So we just talked about one way to do that is cold exposure. So doing a 30 second cold shower a day. A few other things you can do to raise your dopamine levels. Number one, tyrosine is an amino acid that your body uses to make dopamine. So eating a diet that's high in tyrosine can actually raise your dopamine levels. So where do we get tyrosine from? Chicken, fish, eggs, avocados, bananas, almonds, all of those things are high in tyrosine and can also raise your dopamine levels to make you more happy right? To make you more motivated, to make you more concentrated. Tyrosine is a big way to do that. So eating chicken, fish, eggs, avocados, guacamole, bananas, almonds, all of those things are high in tyrosine. Another way to raise your dopamine levels, exercise. Exercise raises dopamine levels. Um, another one, this is called NSDR, non-sleep deep rest, okay? So if you want to write that down, that's something you can do either in the day or if you are waking up at night. Um, I, somebody uh, at my last talk asked me a question like, if I get up and I do good sleep hygiene, if I'm looking at the sun in the morning, if I'm doing the cold shower, will that prevent me from waking up in the middle of the night? A lot of times it does. It helps you stay asleep. But if you do wake up in the middle of the night or if you just have a break during the day, you can do something called non-sleep deep rest. And that has been studied and shown to raise your dopamine levels as well. 
So if you just go to, to YouTube and you just do a search for NSDR, you'll see like Andrew Huberman is one of the ones who does just a, it's a 20 minute kind of meditation and he's, and we're just getting your focus on different areas of your body and breathing. And I do that when I take a quote unquote nap during the day, I just lay down and do 20 minutes of NSDR. Uh, it gives my brain a break, but also increases my dopamine levels. You can find those on, on YouTube really easily and free. Um, practice good sleep hygiene, which is what we just discussed. Um, so not doing blue light before you go to bed, try to keep it as cold and dark in your room as you can. Uh, get up in the morning and try to get those cortisol levels up by viewing sunlight or exercising or sleep, or uh, I'm sorry, a uh, cold, cold uh, shower. And then one other way that you can raise your, your uh, levels of, of, um, of cortisol in the morning is coffee or right, caffeine. So drinking a cup of coffee 30 minutes or so after you wake up, which a lot of people do anyway, that's good in the morning because it increases your cortisol levels and can kind of get your day going. What you don't want to be doing is coffee throughout the day later on. Okay. And then the last one, one other way to increase your dopamine levels is giving yourself a break from your phone. So a lot of research has gone into this too. The more people are on this device right here, constantly checking their email, constantly checking text, checking social media, spending time on there, your dopamine levels go down because this is a dopamine machine. So what this does is it causes dopamine spike, dopamine spike, dopamine spike, dopamine spike. And when you, again, what goes up must come down. So if you have constantly fluctuating levels of dopamine, you're gonna have lower baseline levels of dopamine, which makes you more prone to these things here. So there's a, a great study that's been duplicated so many different times, and they found that people that look at their phone in the first 15 minutes of waking up report themselves to be much less happy than people that don't. And I think we all know this. I mean, probably most of the people on the line I, uh, right now are on the, on the webinar. I didn't grow up with this. So I, I didn't have this when I was growing up. I remember when I got my first pager, um, I, I thought that was amazing, you know, but then, and then it turned into a cell phone and now it's this thing that's, that's it, the brick that's in your pocket all the time. Um, I wouldn't class myself, classify myself as more happy and peaceful since I got this. Am I more productive? Probably. Am I more um, connected to people? Like, like, can people get a hold of me a lot quicker? Yeah. But is that good? What they're saying is it's actually not. Like, I don't, I shouldn't be checking social media, hoping I get a text, hoping I get an alert, hoping I get likes, um, checking my email every 15 seconds. If you do that, that's been shown to be, you've been shown to be less happy over time because your dopamine levels go down. So what I try to do, even with emails, like I try to batch those, like instead of just picking up my phone and blindly going to my Gmail and looking at and seeing if somebody's emailed me, I try to do that a couple of times a day because then I don't get those constant spike, 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 spike. So I try to take a break from technology, especially my phone as much as I can. So, and if you're not going to do anything else, just in the morning, give yourself 15 minutes without looking at your phone. So if your phone is your, an alarm, is your alarm, that's kind of dangerous because you might see you got a text, oh, I got to check that. So give yourself 15 minutes without looking at your phone in the morning. That's been shown to increase your dopamine levels as well. Okay, a couple other things and then we'll wrap it up. Again, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and just drop those in the chat. Uh, number one, uh, these are brain buddies now. So things that you can do to increase your brain function. Number one is L-theanine, okay? L-theanine is uh, the active ingredient in green tea. It's an amino acid that increases your body's GABA, okay? GABA is, uh, GABA, GABA is the brake pedal for your brain. GABA is, the, is like nature's volume. It's the feel-good hormone for your brain. Um, so it increases GABA, increases dopamine levels as well. So L-theanine is what you're looking for. You can get that at any health food store. You can get that on Amazon. And L-theanine is, is really good at doing both of those things. I use L-theanine for people that have anxiety. So people that are suffering with anxiety, um, now, if you're taking any type of anti-anxiety medication, obviously you need to talk to your doctor and make sure L-theanine is okay. That's been shown to be well tolerated, but make sure if you're taking some type of medication for it, talking to the doctor to see if they're okay with you doing L-theanine. But if you're not taking medication for anxiety or, or depression, L-theanine can be very effective, natural way of reducing anxiety levels. So that's a great one. Uh, typically the dosage there is 200 milligrams twice a day. Um, I've had people dealing with like panic attacks that have done, had incredible uh, improvement in their panic attacks by taking L-theanine. Another thing that it does is it helps your sleep levels as well, helps you sleep. So L-theanine is a great way to go if you're dealing with any of those issues. Um, another one is the omega-3 oils that we talked about. So that increases your brain volume or density in the brain and membrane fluidity for cell communication. So it actually helps the brain communicate better and create more neural pathways. So omega oils, that's going to be fish oil, right? That's going to be flaxseed oil. Those are the two big ones. Um, and I recommend fish, fish oil if you're not, you know, vegan. Um, fish oil is a much more effective way to get 
what's called EPA, coastal pentanoic acid, which is what we're really talking about here. It's harder to get that from flaxseed. You can get it from flaxseed oil. You just need to take more flaxseed oil. So for omega oils, I recommend people taking um, at least 2000 milligrams a day. So two grams of fish oil, high quality fish oil per day. And then the last one is vitamin D. So just a couple of studies, we're gonna talk about what vitamin D does for your brain, but this is another thing that came out recently. And I think everybody needs to know this after the last few years that we went through. Uh, this is a PubMed article, um, Journal of Nutrients. Uh, vitamin D deficiency may account for almost nine out of 10 COVID-19 deaths. So if you look at the people that were hospitalized with COVID, 88% of those people were vitamin D deficient because vitamin D is very, very important for your immune system. Vitamin D is also very important for your brain. Okay, so having normal levels of vitamin D, and we'll talk about that in just a second, what the normal level is. Actually, let's talk about it now. So your normal vitamin D level, if you get a vitamin D test from your doctor, or you can get a vitamin D test, you know, even online, you can order a home test where you do a finger stick, uh, you send in the blood spot, and it'll tell you your vitamin D. So your vitamin D level ideally should be between 60 and 80. That's really the most important number you should ever look at on your blood work, not your cholesterol number, not your blood sugar number, not necessarily, it's your vitamin D. Because vitamin D is responsible for immune system function. It prevents uh, 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 so many different diseases. I don't have the chart on the, on the PowerPoint here, but we're talking about reduces your risk of breast cancer by up to 75%, reduces your risk of colon cancer by up to 85%. I mean, massive improvements in your health from high levels of vitamin D. So you want to be between 60 and 80. Now, unfortunately, when you get that blood test, it, the, the normal level for LabCorp is between 30 and 100. So you could be at 32 or 33, which is vitamin D deficient. To, especially when we're talking about optimal ranges, then it would just say you're normal, right? So you want that level to be between 60 and 80. So one of the reasons is for a good brain function. So meta-analysis con uh, conducted in 2017 shows that 25 OHD, that's the vitamin D levels, less than 25 nanograms per mole increases risk for dementia. So we talked about normal levels uh, according to the like lab core being 30 to 100. Well, if you're less than 25, increases your risk of dementia. So again, that's why you want to be higher. That goes, that risk goes down as you get higher. So 60 to 80 is where we want to be. Several studies show the link between uh, vitamin D deficiency and depression. Um, so it has a big effect on depression. So if you're having depression issues, you're making sure your vitamin D is between 60 and 80 is very important. And then also um, vitamin D increases nerve growth factor, um, which is an essential molecule for neuronal survival in the brain, which means it decreases the rate of cell death. So somebody asked earlier, can you do something to prevent or, or reduce the effects of um, aspartame? Well, that's one of the things you can do is have a high levels of vitamin D because it makes the neurons more tough in your brain, more, uh, more inclined to survive in your brain, which is a really, really big deal as well. So that's where your vitamin D level should be. Now, how much vitamin D do you need to take to get to that point? Um, that's different for everybody. So I used to tell people, so a good benchmark is 5,000 IUs of vitamin D, 5,000 international units. The recommended daily allowance is 400 IUs a day. Okay. So 400 IUs a day is the recommended daily allowance, but that's not even close to get you where you actually need to be. So I recommend 5,000 IUs for most people, but again, that's different for everybody. I just had a patient who takes 2,000 IUs a day got his tested and he's at 65, his vitamin D level is at 65. I've had other people that take 5,000 IUs and their vitamin D level is at 33. So when you get the test, you can see, okay, if I'm taking 5,000 IUs of vitamin D and my vitamin D level is 33, I wanna double it to 66 between that 60 and 80 number. So I double my vitamin D and then get it vitamin D tested again in another couple of months. And you can see, is that the right amount? And then once you find the right, right amount, that's just what you take daily the rest of your life. It doesn't fluctuate from there. I have to take about 10,000 I use vitamin D to get my vitamin D levels between 60 and 80. I don't absorb vitamin D really well. There's a lot of reasons for that. Some people absorb it well, some people don't. Um, so that's why we're, uh, we're recommending the vitamin D and it's definitely at a higher level than the RDA recommends. Um, people ask us like, can you take dangerous levels? You would have to take a ridiculous amount of vitamin D for a ridiculous amount of time to have any detrimental effects, but I always want to test, right? Take a certain amount. So if you're taking a couple thousand I use right now, go ahead and test it and see where it's at. If that's good, keep taking that. Otherwise you want to bump that up, uh, accordingly to get it into the 60 to 80 mode. I'd be happy to look at any, you know, blood work that you have. If anybody wants to reach out to me, I'd be happy to do that for you as well. Okay. All right. So. I want to open it up for some questions now. That's 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 what I got for you. So we we talked about sleep, uh, we talked about nutrients, and we talked about activities you could do to increase your brain density. I did get a question here: Are fish uh, oil tablets a good idea, or is eating fish the preferred method? Great question. Um, you can't really get 
it's hard to get enough fish oil from eating fish. Now, I'd still recommend eating fish as much as you can. Fish is good for you for a lot of reasons. You can get a decent amount of fish oil from eating fish. One to two grams, like I talked about. So taking 2,000 grams of fish oil, that's going to be typically done through, through uh, fish oil tablets. Now, what I recommend if you're taking fish oil supplements is, number one, get something as a pharmaceutical grade fish oil, which doesn't have mercury in it. And then you also want something that helps your body break it down. So like the ones that we have in our office, it has something called lipase in it. Lipase helps your body break down the fish oil so you're not getting fish burps afterwards. So if you're taking junky fish oil, a lot of times you'll get fish burps. Like after you take it, you feel like you just ate fish for an hour, which is pretty nasty. Um, so a higher quality fish oil. Um, Nordic Naturals is a good one. Vitamin Cottage Edge is a good one. Design for, Designs for Health is another good one. So taking fish oil capsules is usually the way to go. That's what I do because I just I don't eat enough fish. Um, another good question. So what foods or vitamins can uh, combat a fatty liver? So typically fatty liver is the main source of fatty liver is going to be two things. So number one is alcohol, uh, but that used to be where fatty liver came from primarily. Now it's not. Now it's too many carbohydrates. Now it's too many processed foods. So if you're able to reduce your processed, processed foods, that will also reduce your fatty liver. So eating more fruits and vegetables, eating lower glycemic food. So if you were there at the workshop I did last year, we talked about the advanced plan. So we were really you know, eliminating sugar and we were reducing grains quite a bit. Sugar and grains both increase your fatty liver as well. One thing you can do to increase liver health is uh, milk thistle. Uh, so taking milk thistle or silymarin, it's called, milk thistle reduces fatty liver as well. So that's a supplement that you can take that's really easy, but vitamin changes are even, uh, even better than that. So great question there. All right, any other uh, questions before we wrap it up? I've got a couple more minutes. You got me here. Where can you get milk thistle? Anything that I'm talking about, I, a lot of this I get at, so uh, Sprouts or Natural Grocers is a great place to get all of these things if you wanna get them locally. Otherwise, Amazon, because Amazon bought Whole Foods. So Whole Foods was a really good place to get a lot of these supplements as well. So you can get a lot of these delivered to your door like the next day with Amazon. But otherwise, uh, Sprouts, and, uh, and, and vitamin, it used to be vitamin cottage. Now it's natural groceries. Those are the two that I really recommend. All right. Uh, another good question. Is there much difference between gummy vitamins and re regular tablet vitamins? Not really. Uh, I think that's just become the new way to, to get it delivered to your body. It's kind of the new fancy way to do it is through gummies. The problem with some of the gummies is they have sugar or some of them have aspartame, which is crazy. If you think about it, you're taking a vitamin, you think it's making you healthy and they have artificial sweetener like sucralose, which is the stevia, or not no, stevia, is, uh, sucralose, which is Splenda, or it's also, it could be sweetened with aspartame. A lot of times they're sweetened with stevia, which is a natural sweetener, which is fine, but there's really not much of a difference between those. Um, that being said, I try not to do uh, supplements that are in like the pill form, like just the tightly packed pill form. A lot of times those are not as... Uh, delivered as well. So getting like a gel cap is usually going to be a, an easier way to do it. Gelatin cap. So like a capsule that you could actually take apart, um, going to be much better there. Um, another question. I, I, I don't take any supplemental vitamins. Do you know of a list of vitamins, recommended vitamins for men 55 and older? Great question. So uh, the very first vitamin that you should take is not a multivitamin. Okay. Uh, supplement should be a supplement to your diet. So you can get a lot of vitamins from eating, you know, spinach, you know, a spinach salad gets you a lot of uh, vitamins that are in a multivitamin. So what I do recommend for everybody that has a pulse is the two things that we talked about today. Before I took a multivitamin or anything else, I would take vitamin D and I would take fish oil. Those two things. And that's for anybody of any age, but especially as you get older, okay? especially as you get older, you want vitamin D and you want fish oil. And then if you want to take a good multivitamin, that's okay. What I would recommend instead of a multivitamin though, is like a greens supplement, like athletic greens, or I use one called greens first. It's just a scoop of greens powder that's got extract from, it's like 14 different servings of fruits and vegetables. And you put that in water, you shake that up and you drink that in the morning. Um, the one I use tastes like mint. It actually tastes pretty good. Uh, so that's a good multivitamin. So if I was really going to say, put all that together, I would do vitamin D, I would do fish oil, and I would do a greens and you're covering really almost all your bases there. Yep. Great question. Best, uh, another question, what's the best brand of vitamin D uh, supplement to take? Uh, you want to take one with vitamin K. So there's a lot of them that have, uh, there's a lot of different good brands out there. You want to take one that has vitamin K as well. Vitamin K is really important to go with vitamin D because that directs the vitamin D where to go. It's helpful for your bones. Uh, so a lot of different things. So as long as it has vitamin D and vitamin K, uh, those, are, those are good. 
Uh, should you take your vitamins in the AM or PM? The answer to that generally is it doesn't matter. So if you take them in the morning, some of them you want to take specifically in the morning for a reason, but that's not what I'm getting into here. So if you're just talking about vitamin D and fish oil and those things, it really doesn't matter. You could take them whenever you want to. And then what was the name of the greens? So the big one right now is AG1 Athletic Greens. Um, so that's one you can get online. You can get it most of the, you can get that at, at natural grocers for sure. Athletic Greens. The one I do is called Greens First and it's just Greens First. Uh, the greens first is the one that I use. I like that because I like to taste better than athletic greens. So greens first is the one that we'd be talking about for the one that I use. And it's got the anti antioxidant equivalent of 15 servings of fruits and vegetables. So if you're not getting 15 servings of fruits and vegetables in a day, which most people aren't, then uh, greens are a really good way to cover your bases there. All right. Great questions today. So uh, just remember what we talked about with sleeping, you know, it just doing those free things. So I, I encourage you try a cold shower. Uh, try 10 seconds of a cold shower before you turn it back to warm. Uh, just it's, it's, it's cool to get yourself in that habit. And then, you know, seeing that sunlight in the morning is also really big. A uh, couple last questions. So one more here and then we'll wrap it up. Do you know if glyphosate is transferred for breast milk when nursing it? At, yes, it is. Um, because once it's in your body, almost everything gets transferred through nursing. So really avoiding glyphosate in your own food is big. So I would be looking for that non-GMO or organic or glyphosate free residual. Look for that. Uh, on there. Somebody just said a cold shower helps your hair shine. I love that. I don't have to worry about that, uh, but a cold shower is great for a lot of reasons. So uh, thanks for having me today. I really, uh, really enjoyed doing this. If you have any other questions, uh, my email is uh, Dr. Eric, so D-R-E-R-I-C. I'll actually type it in the chat here. Dr. Eric at axiomhs.com. Come on here. So that's my email address right there. Um, so Dr. Eric, Dr. Eric at axiomhs.com. If you have any other questions, I'd be happy to field those for you. And until then, have an awesome day.